Hi, everybody. Welcome. Glad you all could make it. It's been a very rough couple of weeks since the last time we were in this room. Um, we have a few agenda changes today. Ryan couldn't make it. We're going to just hop over the happy bucks. Um, I'll do the announcements. The networking group, that was something that was on here. We're going to defer that till our next meeting, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the efforts in that spot that we used for um, Hurricane Helene. Um, a reminder, Jenny's out of town, which is why we're a little disorganized today. That's how much we need Jenny, that's for sure. Um, thanks for Jeremy for taking over the setup and the, the registration stuff. Appreciate that. Um, a couple of announcements. This Friday, we're doing a build for uh, Kringle Holiday Village. Um, some of the some of the sets and stuff that they'll need, they're going to build out at uh, Caldwell Construction. That's since moved. It used to used to be off of Verde. Now it's uh, back behind the the Carmax place off of Lawrence Road there. Uh, but they need help. It's from one to four Friday afternoon. Uh, next Thursday is our coffee and conversation. It's a great forum. I encourage you all to come out, bring your friends, bring potential Rotarians along. It's nine o'clock at Vintage Greenville. I think that's on East North Street, if anybody can help. No, I believe it's on East North Street. Uh, next Saturday, we're doing a, um, a book nook build at a Child's Haven. That's one of our new partner organizations with the After Hours Club. Uh, that's Saturday morning at 8.30. And then a reminder, two weeks from today, our luncheon, we'll have um, Lisa O'Connell Hall from Jasmine Road will be here to talk about their wonderful programs they have there. God of the universe, since we are not conscious enough to fathom your ebb and flow, help us then to bring our best efforts to what we can know, to love our friends and family, to treat our employees and fellow workers fairly, to seek justice, to help those in need, to be the best that we can be, and to live by the four-way test. Would you please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and I was asked to do our new members, or, I'm sorry, our guests, if I can find that. We just have one guest today. I believe it's with Brian and Luke Magnum. Did I remember the name? Very good. Luke, would you stand up and like to welcome you? All right. And with that, we'll let Jim come up and talk about CART. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It's a pleasure to make the CART announcement for this month. And I want to thank all the good matchers who have really brought our CART contributions and our support to a new level in the past year or two with your matching. Uh, the matching uh, this month is matched by Surrender Jane. Uh, is he here? Well, I can say anything about it then. The, uh, it is like the man who needs no introduction as far as his support of Rotary. And as many of you know, he... Uh, grew up in India, got his uh, engineering degree there, and then came to the United States, got a master's, and then went on, developed three companies, and is now in the chemical company. His service in the industry, as well as to Rotary in the community, is a bit overwhelming, which was made evidence by the fact that he was awarded the Governor's uh, South Carolina Award for Palmetto Award for Outstanding Service in the State. So we appreciate that. There's a lot I can say about him, but I won't because all of us know. I do want to point out two things. One, I noticed two or three years ago when we had a uh, peace conference, I finally found out toward the end of it that actually he seemed to be performing primary leadership within that. And later on, it appeared to me that he had also contributed to support it. It was not an easy project, but a very good project. And, of course, you know he was a past uh, president here. And the other thing I will mention briefly about him, when I called him up to ask if he'd be interested in matching for CART, I don't think I finished my spiel to him before he said yes, but he's that kind of a community uh, supporter. So 
Surrender, I'm sorry that you're not here today to give you a hand, but oh, please pass the bucket right away. Don't wait till after the speaker, okay? We're excited to introduce the new member today who will be introducing himself, Taylor LeBrand. I'll do it better here. Yeah. So I told uh, Derek before doing this, my name is pronounced Librand, but uh, I'm not, <laughs> I, the way I always describe it is I'm not LeBrand James, uh, even though as much as I would like to be, I'm not LeBrand James. Um, uh, I'm being sponsored by uh, Rusty Infinger, who I don't think is here. Oh, okay, there he is. <laughs> Perfect timing. It always makes an entrance. Uh, so it's kind of funny, me and Rusty found out that we actually had the same professor while we were getting our uh, poli-sci degrees at the University of South Carolina, which, uh, yeah, I was about to say, that, that <laughs> probably says something about the age of that professor more than anything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, my wife and I uh, moved up here about three years ago. Um, for better job opportunities and to be closer to family, which is coming in really handy now that we have a nine-month-old baby girl. So uh, very good choice on our part. Um, I work for TTI. We own a lot of uh, power tool, lawn care, and floor care brands. The one I work with the most is Ryobi Power Tools, which if you go to Home Depot, the bright yellow, green stuff, that's us. Um but yeah, I actually got to know Rotary a little bit while I was in Columbia. Uh, I was a guest at the Main Street Rotary Club there a few times. I uh, saw a Discover Rotary uh, event earlier in this year, decided to attend, and then, you know, the rest is history. Uh, I'm actually helping out Beth and Pam and Derek on the Literacy Committee, so um as the son of a uh, very long time special ed public school teacher, this is kind of, you know, a passion of mine. So I'm looking forward to see what we can do there. So that's pretty much it for me. Sorry, I went over a little bit. All right, I'm back again, hopefully a little bit organized here. Um, we had at this point on the agenda, we had uh, talking about networking opportunities. That was something that came out of the survey. And I hope in our next meeting that I'll be able to talk more about the survey results. I plan to send them out because we're going to stand here and go through 80 slides of survey results in front of you all. So you have a chance to look at it. I'll send out the raw data. You can look at it. Uh, but one of the things that came out of that was a real need, want, desire for better networking opportunities within the club. So I don't see Stacy, but Stacy and Lonnie, who's sitting over there, have agreed to head this up, and they're going to give us an update at our next meeting on uh, how we're going to uh, to work on the networking opportunities. And uh, then, if Terry, if you could bring up my first slide, I wanted to talk. Y'all probably got too many emails from me about a week ago, and. Uh, I guess I won't apologize for that because the cause was dire, but um, our club did a lot of great things through the uh, through Helene to help people who needed help and help people who are in the business of usually helping others. So um, we did throughout the week, we took hot meals over to the families at the Ronald McDonald House. They didn't get power back till Wednesday, but we took meals all week because their chefs couldn't get there. Their chefs who were all volunteers um, we took hot meals over all week. Uh, once they got their power back on Wednesday, we had a couple of people that stepped up. They went shopping um, with the donations from our generous members, refilled their refrigerators and their freezers and uh, their pantry to some extent. So we did a lot of good at the Ronald McDonald House. They were beyond uh, grateful. You can see the photograph, the one on the right here. That's some of the people that either donated or donated time uh, but my sincere thanks to everybody who was uh, part of that effort. Uh, thank you very much. It was well received. Uh, the two women on the slide are from the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, the CEO is on the right there. That's Marty. And then on the left is uh, Kimberly. And you can see Kimberly's short comment on our Facebook post about how appreciated all this was from them. The other thing we did on... Um, Last Friday as well, we had a um, taco lunch for all the Alexander Elementary School at that school families. At that point, most of them didn't have power, and that's always the community in need. So we made, I believe, some 600 plus tacos 
Uh, we set up in an apartment complex that had power because the school didn't. Uh, Scott and I were there from the club, but the club donated quite some money from, from all of y'all to uh, to this cause. Um, you see the picture on the left there. We cooked over 100 pounds of beef in six pound increments. And I was so impressed with a Blackstone, I went home and I bought one. So, and I <laughs> I had no idea how cool those things were. So I'm going to do a free Blackstone ad while I'm up here. But anyhow, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart, from the Ronald McDonald House and from the families of Alexander Elementary School for your generosity of both your money and your time towards this cause. Thank you. And then this... The second thing I want to do, and we're a little bit tardy on this, but they gave out at the uh, at the um, the Rotary year end banquet. I don't remember what's the term. What's it called, Beth? I got her in the middle of awards and installation banquet. It was down in North Augusta this year because our that's the the home turf of our new uh, district governor. But they gave out some membership awards uh, given out by uh, Butch Hughes, who was a membership chair last year. And we're a little tardy. Jenny has been trying hard to get as many of these people to one meeting as she could. And I think she just finally said, no, we're just going to do this. So we'll give out the awards to those who are here. But uh, the first award was for our club in general. And uh, that was because we, for the first time in many, many years, ended on the plus side of the, of the membership column. I think you maybe got to go back to Jane's year since that's happened. And so that was presented to Lisa. Where's Lisa Mangione? Yay, Lisa, who was our club president last year. The, the second award was for what they called the super sponsors, or I believe that's what it was called. Anyhow, these are people who have sponsored 25 or more members lifetime. And I mean, if you add all of those up, that's, that's about the entire population of our club plus. Um, Elizabeth couldn't be here. Terry is here. Where's Terry? Come on up, Terry. <clears throat> 36 people. Jane Dyer, where's Jane? 33. Fantastic. I don't believe Scott is here, so we'll save his. And Philip Kilgore, I haven't seen Philip. Is he around? Philip got honorable mention. That was something we did as a club. Uh, so we have a battle for Philip as well. And then the uh, the last one, and I don't know if any of these people are going to be here, but we'll move on to the last one. If you'll hit that for me, please. Uh, we also received an award for innovative club types for our new After Hours Club, which is up to 29 members now. Uh, that was for Lorraine and Amy and myself who helped get that club off the ground. I'm going to donate my medal to Jenny because she was also absolutely instrumental in getting that off the ground for us and, and keeping us uh, keeping us running. So if for no one else, give a big round of applause for Jenny for all she did on that. And there's a new rule, Jenny is not allowed to miss any more meetings. With the fall social, one more time. I don't have a hat and pipe, so I can't do it as well as Rob. We have our fall social coming up on October 25th at 7 p.m. It's a murder mystery event. It's at the Art Gallery at 906 West Point Cent Highway. Uh, dinner and drinks provided for all members. You can bring your spouse along for $25 um, or a guest or whatever for 25 bucks. And you can RSVP either on DACDP or if you don't want to use DACDP, just send Rob an email and he'll make sure you get get registered. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob to introduce our guest speaker for the day after I get all my stuff up here. Well, good afternoon. I was thrilled when they called and asked me to introduce Will Ragland. Will is a community hero, and he's one of my heroes. I might should call him the Honorable Will Ragland. I think you're supposed to say that about elected officials because he is the mayor of Peltzer, South Carolina. 
So we've got not only a hero, but we have an honorable hero. Let me tell you a little bit about Will. Will was born in Piedmont. He studied at Davidson College, got his bachelor's degree, my alma mater, there. He went on to the Central Washington University and got a master's degree in theater set design. He became an arts teacher at the Sioux Cleveland Elementary School in Piedmont. And, you know, we don't thank our public school teachers. I'm a veteran. A lot of people come up and say, thank you for your service. You know, we should say thank you for your service to every single school teacher or administrator we run into because the, the country would be nothing without them. And so he started out, he started out as an elementary school teacher at the, the Sioux Cleveland, uh, the, the, the Sioux Cleveland Elementary School. He became aware that his students had very little to no exposure to the performing arts, and with that as a motivation, went to Woodmont High where there was no uh, theater program and founded a theater program that I became aware of because I kept hearing about this high school that was going all over the state, winning awards all over the state for the quality of their plays, coming from nothing, and then went from there to Palmetto High, and started one from nothing there, and both of those are still going on, thanks to what he did. In 2012 and 13, he was named the Greenville County Teacher of the Year, becoming the first theater instructor to win that award. That record may still stand. I don't know that if there's another one that uh, has uh, has has joined that that club. And of course, along the way and all during his career, he's acted, he's directed, he's involved in set designs, he's done 160 plays in one of those three capacities. And my favorite of all is when he did the Buddy Holly story, which when he had auditioned for that, he couldn't even play the guitar. And so I don't know if he just told him that he could, but before the thing opened, he bought a guitar and learned to play it. And I want to tell you something. It was the first mega hit that Center Stage had had Will agreed to, it could still be running. It would have it would have broken the record that Phantom of the Opera has up on Broadway. It would still be running. I'm telling you, they, they brought it back three times. I saw it twice. He sang every day, and he sang That'll Be the Day, two songs that I know very, very well. He sang them better than Buddy Holly. I mean, Buddy Holly could have learned from, from him. But I'm leaving out the most interesting part of his life and the part I want to talk about before I, I bring him up. Will is like me. He totally believes in the power of theater to change lives and bring communities together. I know what I'm talking about because theater, <clears throat> theater changed my life. I was in Columbia, South Carolina for 13 years and got very active with a place called Trustus Theater, which is kind of Columbia's warehouse theater. Did, did a lot of uh, very kind of new and, and edgy plays. And I learned more about life, met more people that I would have never met in the banking business, became friends with people that I would have never become friends with, got better perspectives on issues that I didn't fully understand, gained so much that it it was, it was life-changing, and that's what theater can do. And that's why in 2014, when the city of Pelzer came to this drama teacher who was, there he is, he's, he's on the state retirement plan and come happily going through life and having a good time and winning awards and won the, you know, the, the annual award from the South Carolina Theater Association. They come to him with the ridiculous request that he quit his job and come to Pelzer, South Carolina and start a theater company to occupy the historic Pelzer Auditorium. See, Pelzer was, was very smart. They didn't just call it the Pelzer Auditorium. I, I wouldn't walk across the street for the P Pelzer Auditorium. But if you tell me, do you want to go see the historic Pelzer Auditorium? How much, how much is the ticket? Yeah, I want to buy, buy me two so I can bring my wife. So they, because that building was not doing well, a building, a commercial building is like a house. It doesn't do well if it's not occupied. And they realized they needed a point of civic pride. They needed something for Pelzer. Will recognized that. He went down there and in 2014 
he, with a doff of his hat to our textile heritage, called it uh, mill, uh, mill Town Players and started, and they've been highly successful, won all kinds of awards. I've been, I used to not even know where Felser was. I've been to his plays. I, I can even tell you where to eat in Felser. I mean, you know, th that's what he has done for Pelzer, South Carolina. And, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can, can measure a life. You can measure a life through power that a person gained or influence that a person has or money that a person have, has. I think one of the best ways to measure a life is the lives that that person has changed or impacted or enriched. And Will Ragland has impacted, enriched, and engaged with, and improved, and changed so many lives that measured by that standard, he's one of the wealthiest room, person in this room today. And I'm honored to bring up a life changer, Will Ragland. I said, Bob, do you need a bio? He said, I think I've got it covered. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the uh, reminder. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I deal in, in quality, affordable entertainment. So I figured I'd start things off with a, um, a free bad impression. I heard that uh, last week you had um, Burke Royster speak to you. Is that right? Yeah. I used to uh, work at uh, Woodmont High School. And when I first heard the name Burke Royster in a conversation, I thought they were talking about burnt oysters. Like they went to a bad seafood restaurant or something. But uh, Dr. Royster is a great man, a great leader, and... Uh, he has a particular way of speaking. He's from Anderson, which is where I grew up near. So I, I connected and, and recognized it. So uh, here's a bad impression. This is my uh, burnt oysters. Today is a great day for Greenville County Schools. There are many things to be proud of in Greenville County. It's our job to make sure the facilities for teachers and students meet the needs of 21st century education throughout Greenville County. Now, wasn't that ridiculous? I used to call my principal with that voice and ask him to give me a raise. Oh, me. Well, uh, Bob, as you went through all the, the events of, of my life that I forgot about, uh, I was reminded about many different things and how uh, community theater does have a transformative power on a, on a child, on a school, on a community, on, on, on all sorts, in, in all sorts of ways. And I was also reminded about my, my wealth of experiences in the Greenville uh, theater scene. Mr. Jim and I were talking about how many theaters we have in Greenville and how strange that is. Maybe y'all don't realize that, but there, there are so many high quality, locally producing theaters in this city. Uh, more so than most, we've got it good, y'all. And if you're a person who likes to be on stage or design worlds for actors to live in, this is a, a thriving place. I had the best experiences growing up as a young actor living in Greenville and working at Woodmont. I got to work at Center Stage. Laura Nicholas is here. She runs Center Stage. What a great place. The Greenville Little Theater, now Greenville Theater, also Warehouse Theater, and the South Carolina Children's Theater. And I learned everything I know from these people. I was fortunate enough to be a part of what, what we actors call the old guard, right? 
when we were working in these theaters way back in the day, in the 90s, and in the, in the 1900s, right? Early 2000s, and we got to work with the founders of these theaters. And I was paying attention. They taught me everything. I'll never forget when I was a, a shy art student in high school, and I had to volunteer some time at a nonprofit, and a friend of mine was in the production of the South Carolina Children's Theater production of Peter Pan, and I went to see it. And this was in the early 90s, and you know, you could park on Main Street, and the Children's Theater was housed in the old Belks Department building from the 1940s. It was so cool going in there. It's right there where that um, drooling bronze pig is, right there, right next door. And, and walking in there, and Rick Standridge, he founded the, the Children's Theater in 87, and walking in there and having no clue that this world existed, like what you were saying, you know, you find these people, and you're like, where have these people been? These people are fun. They're cool. They're smart. They're interesting. And then being led back into the bowels of this old closed department store and seeing all these set pieces made out of, like, carved foam and all sorts of things. And it's like, what is this? This is something that I never knew I, I wanted or needed. And being introduced into that world by Rick Standridge, who was a salesman, God, he was so good. And he made us believe that we could dream anything and make it happen. And don't worry about the details. We'll figure it out. And I kept that same kind of mentality throughout whatever I was doing. You know, getting to work with the McCullers at Greenville Little Theater, Doug McCoy, the founder of Center Stage. And uh, the great experiences at the Warehouse Theater, mentors that I still call to say, how do you do this? You know, like Shannon Robert, what an amazing scenic designer. She teaches at Clemson. Every time I have a question about something scenically, I give her a call. This one was a Spanish moss. How do you make Spanish moss? And she said, well, you're going to get a bunch of gauze. You're going to tear it up. You're going to dye it, do these different things. And Derek Lewis and I were talking about this technique of how do you make rivets, right? Because I'm building a... Uh, a spaceship for our next show. And it is some rivets and an easy technique is just uh, googly eyes, right? Little googly eyes. You just press on there and to make something that looks, looks real, but creating these worlds, these extraordinary things out of ordinary things, creating something out of nothing was so interesting to me and taking ordinary people and putting them on stage and seeing what they can become in a matter of weeks or a months is, is astounding. And, you know, learning all of these wonderful things from these theaters, and Bob mentioned Buddy Holly, and that, that changed my life. I'd always loved Buddy Holly's music, and I knew they were doing that show. And I foolishly thought I, I could be Buddy Holly, a, a bald Buddy Holly, you know. So I, I did learn Peggy Sue, and I didn't know how to play guitar, and I went in there, and they gave me a shot. And that was a journey that didn't quite stop. And still today, at our shows down in Pelzer, people still talk about Buddy Holly, how much they loved it. But, um, you know, being able to research him and how he sounded and, and annotating the lyrics to all of his songs and watching old YouTube videos, and it was just fascinating to me. All these lessons I learned, I used when I was teaching my students. And Woodmont High School was really the training ground for everything I do today. Running a high school theater department is more difficult than running a town. At Woodmont, we had beautiful facilities, no funding. They dropped me in the deep end of the swimming pool with no swimmies and said, sink or swim, buddy, and it better be good. So I had to figure it out. Didn't know how. I had to figure it out. And I dreamed big, bigger than I ever should have. I had no business doing what I did at Woodmont High School. I still think about those grand productions that we did. Peter Pan. Y'all, we did Peter Pan in a high school. I brought in Flying by Foy from Las Vegas. Cost me $6,000 with custom harnesses where they had a flight director fly to Piedmont to teach my students and their dads how to operate the system to make them fly on our stage. We took the original play that Jay and Barry wrote and we recreated it in our own way. We were highly ambitious. I had a fight choreographer from, from Flat Rock Playhouse come down and teach us how to use these stage combat swords and weapons. 
the uh, the Indians from Neverland. We call them Neverland natives, and they were all like dressed in blue um, outfits, kind of like from Avatar, which the kids thought was great. I, I wrote down lines that I thought they would be saying, and somebody had a friend in Cherokee, North Carolina, who um, spoke them in Cherokee, and we recorded them. And so Tiger Lily and all the Neverland natives, every time they said something, they were actually speaking Cherokee on stage. I mean, who does that, right? It's insane. And this production was so grandiose, it probably cost us $40,000. And again, the budget was zero. But it's okay. Don't worry about the details. We'll figure it out, right? And we did. We actually made money on that show. And I'll never forget, I actually uh, I cast this little boy. I said, I need a Peter Pan who was a real boy, not a middle-aged woman in tights. Okay, we're not doing that nonsense. I want a real kid whose voice hasn't changed. I want the real Peter Pan. I didn't know who it was going to be. And this little fellow walked in. I knew him because I taught his brothers. He came from a broken home, a deadbeat dad. He didn't have a lot of confidence. But this little boy was Peter Pan. He'd never been in a play in his life. I'm like, dude, you're going to be Peter Pan. And he, we got to our first rehearsals. He had trouble reading fluently. He had failed first grade. And I thought, oh, dear, what have I done? We're going to keep working. It's going to be all right. I see it. I know his potential. I know he can do it. And this boy worked so hard and uh, did such a great job. And I'll never forget, we were getting towards the end, about to open the show, and he broke down and he was crying I said, Gary, what's wrong, man? What's going on? And he said, I'm going to ruin this. He said, I can't do this. I'm going to ruin this show. I said, Gary, dude, yes, you can. Yes, you can do this. You're going to do this. You're already doing it. Just trust me. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. And let me tell you, this little boy, he killed it. He was great. And on opening night, his whole family was in the front row, bawling their eyes out. The whole show. Because they were so proud of him. And I'll never forget, I played Captain Hook, which I loved. I loved playing a villain. Especially uh, a villain who wants to kill children. It was awesome. I said, Garrett, we had this, this kick butt fight scene on the pirate ship at the end. I said, Garrett, we are filming tonight. We have got to hit all of our marks. It's got to be the best fight scene ever. Pirates of the Caribbean. We had underscoring. We had stage combat swords. Oh, it was great. And man, we were on fire and we were fighting and Garrett was flying in the air and I was missing and I was getting tired. And we come to this part where Hook gets tired and Pan stabs him and the music stops. And this little four-year-old boy screamed. He goes, yes. And everybody laughed because he was so enthralled and believed in the story, cheering for Peter Pan to win, to beat the villain, Captain Hook. And as I sat on that stage dying, I thought that made it all worth it right there. Because that little four-year-old boy, when the pirates came out onto the stage, he leaned over and asked his mother, are they real? He believed the story. He believed the magic. And afterwards, I got to take my picture with him with my big old nasty hook, and it was so much fun. But it's that same idea that we had this another crazy idea for Milltown players. And um, I'll make sure I'm not talking too much. Here we go. So... I saw what it did for Woodmont. I knew what it could do for a greater community. And I saw a need for quality and affordable to be hand in hand. We could do it at the school level. I knew how to figure it out. I just needed a place. And the historic Pell's Auditorium became that place. It had been built by the cotton mill in 1920 for Pelzer High School and as a roadhouse for traveling vaudeville troops who would come by train and perform for the mill workers. Now, Pelzer, back in the day, back in the heyday, was a bustling cotton mill town. It really was. Uh, if you don't know the history behind Pelzer, that's a whole other story. 
Uh, it was founded in 1881, the first modern cotton mill in Anderson County. And the person who led that was uh, Ellison Adger Smythe. That was his first cotton mill where he tried out all of the different things that he learned. And of course, he was very much involved in Greenville's history and actually lived in Greenville. But Pelzer was a bustling place. In 1890, we had 4,000 people. And to compare, Greenville had 8,000. So I can say that back in the day, we were half the size of Greenville, little old Pelzer, right? But as you know, as the cotton mill industry left, it took everything with it, and Pelzer became a defunct, dead mill town, and all the life that was directly connected to that industry disappeared. This is a similar story for so many towns in the upstate who are trying to figure out how do we reinvent ourselves? What's the next chapter in this book? What is this going to be? And so I saw this opportunity. I thought, I'm going to pay tribute to the textile mill industry, and I'm going to do something that I haven't seen quite yet, which is a quality community theater experience at an affordable price. We started 10 years ago, and our ticket prices were 10 bucks, with $8 for seniors and $7 for students. That's it. I don't know how we've made it 10 years. We have remained vigilant in fulfilling that mission to our own detriment. We raised our ticket prices this season by $1. They are now, uh, over the years, that is, they're now $16 and, and $14 for seniors, military, and students. So we produce these um, insane shows, just like we did back in the school days, at affordable prices. And my idea was that now we are accessible to anybody who wants to see a show can. Now, what that has done has created a very interesting and appreciative and wonderful audience. Having performed at all of these theaters in Greenville, I loved every, every single one of them. And I'm friends with all of those folks. And I still attend all their shows like we were talking about. I really enjoyed doing that, learning and being a part of that community. But you know, when you, when you have affordable ticket prices, the people who show up are so appreciative and they don't necessarily go to see all the shows. They don't necessarily go to the Peace Center, which is amazing, by the way. I saw Lion King recently. I've seen it three times. I still got emotional, you know. Um, but it, it's a different group. And we come out after the shows and we meet them, you know, on the sidewalk on the lawn. And they shake our hands. They say, I just love that. That was so wonderful. And so there's this personal connection where the community really is behind what we are doing. And it, to this day, I don't know how we have gotten to where we are. It is amazing to me, surviving the pandemic, surviving all sorts of things. And yet each year, this past season, we had um, 23,000 people come to Pelzer to see a show. Isn't that crazy to think about? In a town that's only 1,400 population, and it's the only thing going on. Uh, one story I did want to share because I thought it was so funny is that a few years ago, we we have been entering competitions in the past, one act competitions, state community theater one act competitions, and we've done well in the past. And uh, we had this crazy idea that I've been thinking about for a long time. You know, in school, we had talked about uh, Shakespearean actors and what they sounded like. And at one point, a professor told me that the closest thing we have that exists today that sounds like the Shakespearean actors might be Appalachia. Okay. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. So I thought about uh, Romeo and Juliet, a play I've directed before, and I thought, okay, how do we introduce this in a, in a unique way? So we performed Romeo and Juliet as if they were the Hatfields and the McCoys in Appalachian dialects. It totally worked. You know, and some things that you read in a Shakespearean play, if you say it in your uh, country Appalachian accent, it totally makes sense. Yonder she lies. Right? I mean, do you bite your thumb at me, sir? No, sir. But I do bite my thumb. Right? It was so much fun. We didn't have them fighting with rapiers, you know, in, in Renaissance costumes. They were fighting with, like, bowie knives and shovels. And when Romeo kills Tybalt, he takes out a pistol and shoots him in the head. 
and drops dead. And this was such an interesting, unique show that the judges loved it. And so it won the state competition, and I was so surprised that it won the Southeastern competition. And we got to go to nationals with this show, y'all, in 2019 to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. There were only two teams from the Southeast there, and here we were, Pelzer, South Carolina, with our Appalachian Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> and... uh we were a novelty in that town. Folks from all over the country who had never met a Southerner before. You know, we were like aliens or something. They were like, keep talking, keep talking. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, and the funny thing was, is when we, when we performed Romeo and Juliet on that stage, you know, the stereotype of a Southerner is that we're dumb, we're silly. You see that in television and movies. Every Southern actor is either stupid, silly, or evil. And so when they started hearing these words that they've heard before in this accent, they thought it was a comedy. They started laughing at us like it was a joke until Romeo pulls out a pistol and shoots Tybalt in the face. And then they got quiet. But here's the thing, that's exactly the way the play is written. It's a comedy until somebody dies. And afterwards, they were just so fascinated by us. And I'll never forget, my costumer was a sweet little old lady who was uh, the mother of one of my students, and she's just so sweet. She does a great job, but she had no clue what a deadline was. No clue. So we're getting closer to opening back home in Pelzer. And I was like, what are we doing about costumes? You know, we, we did all this stuff, age and appropriate and, and Hatfields McCoy's 1880s, right? That's what we're doing. And so she ended up needing some help. And of course I had to step in very last minute. I go to every Goodwill Salvation Army thrift store in the upstate. I brought no measurements with me. I just started grabbing stuff, pants, vest, shirt, coat, mostly for the men, okay? I'm just grabbing stuff. I show up with another uh, costume person to help me. And I said, all right, guys, line up. This is like Wednesday of dress rehearsal week. We open in two days. And I say, here, take that, take that. Okay, good, good. Does that look good? Great, move, next. I'm not joking. And then they aged them and sprayed them with spray paint and tore holes in them and ripped them in shreds and made them look like they were, you know, living in the, in the mountains for years. We ended up winning best costumes at the national competition. And I'm sitting there going, you got to be kidding me. That was goodwill and spray paint in two days. Hey, it's community theater. Anything's possible. Dream big. Don't think about how you're going to make it happen. We'll figure it out. And uh, we're still here today doing our thing. And um, we're excited to have completed 10 seasons. And my job is so strange, y'all. My jobs, so strange. Kelly, you can you can talk about this being a you know a leader in a small town. So strange. In the same day that I am building a spaceship boarding ramp, I'm dealing with a sinkhole while a company is paving Frost Street. It is so strange. Um, this current production, it's a Southern Gothic comedy. I've had to figure out how to make a woman spontaneously combust in an outhouse. And when I read the play, that's what sold me. It's like, okay, the out exploding outhouse, you got me there. So uh, one thing we're also proud of is that everything we you see on our stage is local. All of the actors, all of the artists, all the directors, the designers are local to upstate South Carolina. I'm so proud of that. I'm so proud of that. And also mixing in people with different uh, levels of experience and background. First timers and folks who've been doing this for decades, all on the same stage. And everybody gets into it. It's that mentality of, we're going to dream big. We're going to work hard. We're going to do this. And if you ask me how, I don't know. But it's going to happen. So let's make it happen. And somehow, we always do. And last night, I got to see the spaceship boarding ramp lower at the end of the show.
just like I'd envisioned it. As she climbs on and is taken away by the space people into the, the sunset. Amazing. In Pelzer, of all places. So um, if you would like to come see what we're doing, uh, I brought a couple of brochures, but we've got a website, milltownplayers.org. I would say this, even if you don't come down to Pelzer, go see a show that's locally produced. We got great artists in this town. And I say this all the time. Talent does not know a zip code. Okay? It doesn't. That little boy, Garrett, later on, uh, went on to win Best Actor at the state competition his senior year. The boy who said he couldn't do it because he was ashamed that he couldn't read well and that he'd failed a grade. Ashamed of himself, ashamed of his family. Being put in a play changed his life, just like it did mine and Bob's. Thanks for listening. Appreciate y'all. And if you've got questions for me, I'd be glad to answer them. Yes, sir. Yeah, for this season, um, I bet y'all are going to ask me how do I choose the shows, which I'm going to be glad to talk about. But um, this Christmas, our people love music and country music. They really love. So we're doing a country music concert this Christmas called A Honky Tonk Christmas with a live band. It's going to be fantastic. And then in the winter, we're doing an Agatha Christie mystery thriller. We've never done an Agatha Christie before, ever, never. And we're doing, and then there were none. I'm very excited about that. And then a one weekend concert of uh, crooners, a crooners concert called Come Fly With Me, the big Frank, Frank, uh, Frank Sinatra fan. I'm excited about that. And then in the spring, we're doing a themed concert uh, called Heat Wave, which features the music of Motown. Our folks have been asking for that for a long time. Then in June, a very well-known comedy called The Odd Couple, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard of. And then the big spring giant summer musical is South Pacific. That's going to be tough and wonderful. And then after that, we've got uh, an Elvis impersonator all the way from Honeypath, South Carolina. And that's why we're featuring him, because he's local and he is great. His name is Austin Irby. He's performed with us many times, and everybody loves him. We did a themed concert last Christmas called Blue Christmas, and now I've put together another themed concert where I'm taking songs from um, Blue Hawaii and Aloha from Hawaii via satellite and combining it and calling this concert Raka Hula. And that's how we're going to end off our season. And then we're shutting down for a little bit because... We got a big old fat grant to replace our seating, half of which is original to 1920. So we're working with Craig Golden Davis, and we're going to replace all of our seats, which is the biggest complaint of our citizens because we are bigger than we were in 1920. <laughs> And uh, we've got some issues with the floors and stuff like that. So we got a big old fat grant from the state of South Carolina, which is so exciting, but it's also scary. But we're going to renovate the historic Pelzer Auditorium and try to make it um, ready for the next phase of its life. Oh, yes. We're going to sell everything. <clears throat> and then I'm going to take the parts. Then I'm going to take the parts that I can't sell and make something cool that you want to buy. <laughs> okay, very good question. This is how I do it. Uh, everyone does it a little bit differently. First of all, I like to offer variety. We have a bit of a pattern. We like to open with a play, usually in October. I'm starting to move in this direction. Most theater companies who do open, open in September with uh, a big musical. And I found that being a small, new community theater, I had a hard time competing, finding talent for a big musical with all the other big musicals. So I said, hey, let them do their big musical in September. I'm going to slip in something in October, a play, probably dark themed. Last year was Arsenic and Old Lace. So we start off with that. <clears throat> and then Christmas, it's got to be music. Got to be something with music. Got to be. And then so we alternate. It's going to be play, concert, play, concert, play, musical. So you have that variety. 
We always like to do a big grand musical in the summertime, usually in July, August, because we get to use our college kids. We're back home for the summer. Usually it's a classic musical, uh, such as uh, Oklahoma or um, what else have we done? I've already, I've, I, it's hard to remember them all, but this last summer we did a newer one called Bonnie and Clyde, which was very exciting. And so uh, I, put, I send out surveys. I've got an email list of about 13,000 people and I ask them and they respond. I say, out of these shows, what do you want to see? And it influences what we pick. Uh, so we try, always try to think about the audience first. Like, is this something our people want to see or we think they want to see it? And that drives everything because as artists, there are things that we want to do that we think would be fun to perform or be a part of that may not sell. On the spectrum from art to entertainment, the closer you get to art, the fewer tickets you're going to sell, right? So what we try to do is this. We provide entertainment in an artful way. And if we do something that's more art-based, we do it in an entertaining way to find the balance in between so that we appeal to as many people as possible. That's a great question. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Royster is only able to join us about every other year for our teacher of the year. So next year, I would like to extend the invitation now for you to come to our teacher of the year and, uh, and take his place. It'd be great. Also say, I owe my very existence to community theater. That's how my parents met. Um, I did not get their talent. The last play I tried out for in middle school, they asked me if I would do the stage lighting. So but a uh, great organization. We've also asked him to sign our, our book for Alexander Ele Elementary School, which he's done. I'll give it to Mike on the way out the door. Just our, our reminders of our, of our big three or our big four, please. There's plenty of time to help Jane out and sponsor Kringle Holiday Village or to work with her to find sponsors or any other thing. Please talk to Jane. She's got lots of opportunities for you. Number two, Bring somebody to Discover Rotary. Bring somebody to our Thursday coffees. Um, get somebody involved with our club. We'll take it from there. Um, and you yourselves get involved. We saw some great involvement through uh, our service opportunity with, uh, with the hurricane last week. Get involved with your club. And lastly, and most importantly, have fun. So with that, will you join me in the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Whoops. There we go.